Right, uh, so it's Sunday morning and I'm a religion PhD. Uh, don't worry, you haven't mistakenly suddenly turned up at mass. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about being a humanities researcher who is now in tech, how I got here, things I've learned along the way, and why I think it's important people are exposed to the possibility of learning to code. So I was born in the 80s, and I grew up playing with Meccano and Lego and doing those classic building style games. In high school, um, my maths faltered, so I not only ended up doing two unit, but I did physics and chemistry for the um, HSE, and I planned on going into engineering, but with only doing two unit maths, I'd need a 90 plus there, and that just wasn't gonna happen. So um, I wasn't really interested in doing a Bachelor of Science because I wasn't really that enthused about continuing on with just straight physics or chemistry. And no one had really mentioned or encouraged me to look at computers. So, and I didn't have one at home until I was in year 10 or 11. And by that stage, I'd moved out of like really pulling things apart and putting them back together. So I decided to go on to a Bachelor of Arts where I could study the areas of humanities that I hadn't really been able to um, look at in high school. So my BA was pretty straightforward. I studied some medieval history, various religions, and I went on and did, a, uh, did my honours about a modern pagan religion. And then in my masters, I began my love for religion and popular culture. And I wrote about the computer game Age of Mythology, which is a side uh, game to Age of Empires series. So it was during my masters that I also became a bit more tech aware and involved with computers. Had the prompting of my partner. I built my own computer, which was terrifying when you've got to push the RAM in and it's really, it's like it's not going in. You think you're going to break it. And with my subject area involving new media, I was engaging with some newer areas, um, newer fields of research. I had a year off between my master's and my PhD. And during that time, I started working in an IT role. And in it, we accessed parts of our identity management system through the command line. And being shown this, my mind was blown. It's just like magic. You type things in, and then more stuff comes up on the screen, and then you type more, and it was just like amazing. It was so magical. So this prompted me to install Ubuntu on my new laptop. However, as I was doing a humanities PhD, I didn't really get to do much with it. And given Ubuntu and my, re my um, referencing software didn't really play well together. Um, and my laptop was extremely heavy, I ended up just starting to use the computers at uni. So I continued to work in IT casually during my PhD, but these four years were dedicated to my research, which was again looking at religion and popular culture, this time looking at three case studies, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, which is a young adult novel series, Okami, a Japanese console game, and World of Warcraft, which I assume you've all heard of. And if you're wondering what exactly I'm doing in my thesis, it was essentially this. Oh, look, there's a thing in the game or novel that's taken from real world religions and cultures, now let's analyze it. And for those curious, that's a statue of Ashara um, from World of Warcraft, um, and it's compared with um, the Hindu deity Shiva doing a dance that will destroy the universe. And the second is a pillar that you'll find in most troll settlements in World of Warcraft. And it's compared with serpent pillars from the Temple of Warriors at Chichen Itza. Okay, so um, has anyone here done humanities either in undergrad or postgrad? Okay, so a few of you. But for the others, it's like um, my PhD was very hermeneutics based or text based research which is what you'll find in a lot of humanities, but some sections will do things a bit differently. But in essence, the process of doing humanities PhD is repetitive. You do lots of research and reading that is going through books and articles, finding those sources to begin with, writing it all up, and then giving it over to your supervisor to read over, who will then give you feedback and point out more stuff you've got to read and thus repeat the process. As I was looking at computer games, I also had to integrate that research into this routine as well. If we go back to the previous slide, so I would look at various things in the popular culture case studies, and then I'd have to scour sources 
to find the comp um, comparisons. Sometimes it was easy, things were familiar, I was familiar with already, so like Hindu iconography. But in case of Mesoamerican architecture, I'd spend hours looking at images, just trying to find a crossover. It's like, oh, yay, people have put holiday snaps up on the internet from going to Chichen Itza. Okay. Mm -mm. Oh, that's something useful. Can I find something a bit more concrete? And I'm not just, you know, referencing, hey, someone went there on holiday. Um, and a lot of the time doing this information, so a lot of the time is spent doing this information gathering and processing and analyzing that information. And even this is very hermeneutic style of research, so different to those who do field work. But this is how you learn and produce in a humanities um, framework. Lots of prep work, then the doing, then the feedback from an outside source. So towards the end of my thesis, I was over it. And if you talk to other people who've done a PhD, they feel the same way. Just at the end, just, just be over. I want to move on with my life. Just please, dear gods, be, make my thesis just be done. And it was at this point I wanted something new in my life, and I decided I wanted to explore more of that stuff that had really excited me when I started my IT job. So I figured I'd learn some programming after my thesis was done, and my partner suggested Python. So since October 2013, I've been learning Python. I started with a Coursera course, and that went really well. But continuing on from there, I've run into a few problems. Firstly, I have to go back to being a beginner. After becoming effectively an expert in a subject area, I'm now back to basics and it's this massive disconnect. Stuff I've just been learning, I'm teaching to teenagers at the Girls Programming Network and there are girls in primary school that are just so advanced and reconciling that with my own stage of learning can be confronting. And there are also lots of resources out there for learning the basics so I have the basics down, variables, lists, creating simple functions. But where to from here? And what next? Where's my 201 stuff? And there's also the whole way of finding information and getting help on topics. Well, how I would find information for my thesis topic is different to how I need to go about finding information to help progress with coding and trying to, find, and trying to fit it in with other problems. Um, this also leads to the overarching issue of need to reframing my thinking about myself and remember I'm just starting. Those 10 plus years at university don't really relate to all of this and I need to relearn how to learn. So I came across this little thing of fail, first attempt in learning. And I think it really fits well in learning to code as you, need, as you learn the most when things go wrong and you need to fix them. And actually work out how to make it do what you want it to do. Play around, build things, see what's on, uh, see what works, see what doesn't, do hands-on stuff. Not sitting there reading a book on Python and then trying to do stuff. So this idea as failing as being important can be difficult as often we are averse to failure. It can be confronting, upsetting, and most people don't talk about it. Now this is something that Josh Simmons um, was talking about yesterday. And Kate Pierce discussed last month in her keynote at UnrestCon. We need to be more vocal about failure, as most of the learning is done by failure. It's like we learn and we grow when we fail. And it's just something we don't discuss. There isn't much discussion of the weeks we spent staring at or hacking on problems, wondering what we missed, why it isn't doing what it's supposed to do, and then suddenly that realization, oh, it was that thing there. It was, you know, this thing, I mistyped that. Why did I not see that before? We talk about successes, but not the journey of failures that led to that success. But in this style of learning through failure, you also come across error messages, which as Tim Dorborn from Grok Learning was talking about the other month at the Sydney Python meetup, they can be somewhat unhelpful. Probably definitely was occurred there, ABS. But being a new person and just having bright red syntax error, invalid syntax, is really unhelpful. 
I was talking about this to my partner and they said, I don't know what you're talking about. You just copy and paste it into Google and you have your answer. <laughs> and having working in tech support, Googling error messages was not something new to me. However, answers and help you get from like Cisco VPN and Windows um, errors is very different to programming. Windows error guides, you're dealing with UI and navigating that, and it's not so bad. Programming answers, however, start using words that I don't know the meaning and context of. For example, array and matrix. A month and a half ago, I was talking over a problem I was stuck on with my partner, and they said, oh, you probably want to build an array or a matrix. And I'm like, what? What's that? And they explained, and um, when they were referring to what they were referring to, and I was like, oh, I, I did that like two years ago in Coursera. But they didn't use that terminology, it's just something new. There's this completely different use of language involved, and searching what these terms means can be troublesome, as they just lead to articles filled with more tech jargon that can, be, uh, um, that can be overwhelming, and you see this in all fields. So, word function. So, in everyday use, it's like, an activity that is natural to or the purpose of a personal thing. A relation or expression involving one or more variables. Now that's maths. And if we use it as a verb, work or operate in a proper or particular way. If we're working to program, if we regard to programming, a function is a block of organized reusable code that is used to perform a single related action. Functions provide better modularity of your application and a high degree of code reusing. And that's not even getting onto the definition of functional programming from the Python docs website. Now, from religion, transcendent function. Religion provides a medium through which people are able to experience God, the numinous, or transcendent. And that's one of three uses of function definitions to describe a functional religion if you're using functional religion as your means of defining religion. So, Concepts of words having different uses in different fields is understandable, but excessive use of these words is a problem as it effectively gatekeeps a subject area to newcomers, and it is intimidating these, these use of words in a way that I'm unfamiliar with. So I'm talking about these problems, but what about solutions? <coughs> Firstly, I think we need to normalize failure. It is a path to learning more um, about what you are doing. We learn from our mistakes, and we are always going to make mistakes. We are always going to, um, yep, yeah, we're always going to make mistakes. On a side note, it ensures that we understand the greats in our field are fallible and human. We need more plumbers and less rock stars. Also, I think teaching people different ways to problem solve. Coming from humanities, I haven't really had to do much hands-on problem solving. And had how to organize information, how to organize information in chapters, what's going to flow best, where to put things. Now it's how do I make this code do what I want it to do? So person, I personally enjoy visualization through getting pen and paper out, writing bits of pseudocode, drawing lines to bits and pieces, and it's like, Noting to people that there are these different ways to work through problems, talking to a duck or teddy bear, reading your code backwards, giving people tools to help themselves, but also being a sounding board to people, providing community. Normalizing things that, normalizing that things don't always work and that stuff takes time. And also I think that we need to know that words that your field uses and how they can be simplified or explained in layman's terminology to make it all accessible to those of us that who are new to the field. This isn't dumbing it down. It's making the place more welcoming to someone who didn't spend the past X years studying this field. We need to learn and tech jargon is alienating to people who don't understand it. Okay, so. In addition to all of this, I think teaching people to code is important. So one of the things I do is I volunteer with the Girls Programming Network, which is based out of Sydney Uni, and we teach girls how to program. So this was last weekend, but I unfortunately didn't make it to that one because I was horribly ill. Um, and 
yeah, we have high school girls or girls from year three onwards turn up and we have a volunteer thing. It's all women and yeah, we teach them. So now I might feel that this is important because I was not taught about computers in high school. But I also know that if I had, I would very likely had, have had a very different journey in life. And I might not have ended up in tech as the tech world is not that great for women. And it's only that I'm here later in life where I have a good support network and I'm in a better place to deal with any toxic stuff I come across that I'm able to continue on in this path. I'm in a much better place to deal with this than if I was a 20 year old. But I think one of the big things I want for people is to be exposed to programming early in life so they, they know about it and that it being an option for them. Regardless of what direction they might take after regarding their studies and career, knowing the basics of the coding or what it is possible to do can help them in the future. With the Australian curriculum now um, including programming as a mandatory subject from primary school onwards, this will happen. However, while I believe teaching kids to code and exposing them to it, I also believe we should be encouraging them to engage and understand with various parts of the humanities. Now there are some pieces on this and combining them into um, combining humanities and STEM or STEAM and and is really important and it is another aspect of diversity we need to understand and take on. We need the humanities and STEM to come together because there is a lot we can learn from one another. Humanities peoples are learning to code to sift through data sets. But where the humanities is going to help STEM is the understanding the human side of things. The article this image is taken from by uh, Amy Wibowo or um, Sailor Mercury um, discusses this well. Uh, large historical and scientific breakthroughs happen because of human emotion. And no part of STEM work is free from the human element. All of your data is biased because your algorithms are biased. Why? Because a human wrote them. So there needs to be this connection with humanities to have the tools to analyze and critique this information. So where I would like to end this is that we are all here because we are in some way related to tech and coding. But please remember that other fields bring important things to the table too. So sure, encourage people to learn to code and use tech, but don't do it in a way that will discourage them from looking at other different fields and maybe do something about helping to break down those barriers and walls that have been built up between STEM and humanities because they're really terrible and toxic. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lauren. Um, we have some time for questions right now. So anybody want to ask some questions to Lauren? Yep, sure. Um, what kind of computational theology or biblical studies or textual analysis projects have really impressed you? Um, so using computation and... Yeah, to, for, in, in that theology context, when you were doing theology, how uh, much were you exposed to there of researchers using okay. computers to solve theological problems. So that hasn't really been happening. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yep, one second. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I've had a very similar journey to you. I've come from a biology PhD, started learning Python a couple of years ago. So I actually nearly sim submitted a very similar talk, so I'm really glad you did it. Um, what's next for you? Are you going to stay in humanities? Are you going to move into programming? Uh, so I have a couple of projects that I want to do. So uh, if I look at the field that I did and the stuff that I did for my PhD, I can't really apply a lot of Python coding to what I did because it's very visual based. It's very, you need to eyeball it. Um, but moving forward, 
I do want to do some web scraping and textual analysis and do things like um, looking at local newspapers that are online and actually looking at negative versus positive language use when um, particular religions are mentioned and then also correlating that with the demographics of that area and also just general uh, perceptions that come out of that area regarding religions and Great. Anyone else? Uh, I'll come to you later. Hi, thanks for that. Uh, I appreciate your comment about um, women who coming into tech uh, maybe later in life perhaps being better prepared to deal with tech and, you know, having a better support network. I think that's a really um, valuable insight because there is so much focus on uh, throwing more girls into the funnel, as uh, Russell talked about this morning. Um, do you know of any programs in Australia that are targeted towards women, like maybe doing a career change or like a little bit older transitioning into tech? No, I don't. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, I was just wondering if you're familiar with the software carpentry stuff aimed at research scientists and whether something like that could potentially be adapted for humanities research. Um, so. I, it probably could because like, and I think that Brenda uh, Moon is looking at doing that. And it's like, it, it is like we are seeing like an uptick in use of um, code and things in things like sociology because they've got those data sets and stuff that they need to go through. Um, I know someone that's moved from like doing sociology of religion stuff and they've been teaching themselves R and Python. So I, I think that that kind of thing would actually be quite useful. I'm sorry, just to add to that, the University of Melbourne has a research platforms which teaches digital humanities and you can do software carpentry courses on natural language processing and various other tools and tips. Uh, and it was started by someone who did a PhD in Roman history and then taught herself Python and R. Awesome. Um, thanks, Lauren. That was really inspiring. Um, just a quick comment for the person who asked about um, support networks for women getting into coding and um, I'm in the same boat. Um, in Melbourne, there's a fantastic organisation called Geek Girl Academy, um, which is about encouraging uh, girls and women to um, learn about all things uh, coding and STEM related. Um, in Sydney, we've got, well, I think this is a more general women who code um, have chapters in different cities and there's also geek girl dinners um, which I've been to a few of in Sydney and the girls programming network that um, Lauren and I and Amanda and a few other people here um, volunteer at in Sydney is looking at expanding to other states. Um, I know that they've talked about um, organising it in Canberra and Brisbane. I'm not sure if anyone in Melbourne is interested in um, supporting that as well. But there are definitely some um, movements now to support more, more women who want to get into um, what's been very traditionally a male-dominated field. So thanks. Yep. Anyone else? Oh, is that it? OK. Um, Lauren, one more thing. Yep. Uh, on behalf of PyCon Australia 2016, I'd like to present you a small gift for your talk. Yep, thank you for your time. Uh, one more round of applause for Lauren, please. <laughs>